Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry, I'm not going to speak Greek um, because my Greek is embarrassing sometimes. I have ordered salata me bazuria. Eftichos den ichane. Um, that's my company. Um, like every company, that was a startup. And that was a startup in 2003. Um, I left a, a very long career with international ad agencies. Very successful career, I might say, if you don't mind. Um, very glamorous and very, very well paid too. And I decided to come and live in Greece because this is really what I, this is really the place that I really love. I just love it. Everything's just right here. And I started this company over here, which is called Felix BNI. And it's a global brand strategy consultancy based here in Athens. I work around the world. I work with a couple of Greek clients, primarily outside of Greece. But my business really is global. And it's a startup. It was started in 2003 here in Athens. Now, in New York, before I came back here, I was at TBWA, another startup by another Greek called Tragos, Vasilis Tragos from Kalamata, by the way. The famous ad agency TBWA was started by a guy from Kalamata, okay? And um, we, TBWA had, had amazing clients, I mean, Absolute Vodka, Sony, PlayStation. And in 1997, I was the head of the global network at TBWA, and we had a call from Apple, and they wanted to see us. And I went to see Steve Jobs. That was in 1997, and I walked into this room, and the guy was barefoot. I was wearing jeans, dressed more or less like this, and I felt like I was going to a ramo, because he was like sepolitos, right? And we spoke for four hours, a lot. And I walked out of that meeting with two things that he said. The first thing was, let's make a dent on the universe. Let's make a dent on the universe. Not let's make a lot of money. Not let's launch a new product. Let's make a dent on the universe. Second thing he said, good enough is not good enough. You know how many times I hear in Greece, Ftaneresi. Mia chara ine. Ochi. Mia chara then ine mia chara. That was in 1997. And we, we then did a very famous piece of advertising called Think Different, which I'd like to show you. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Fast forward, 2011, I was invited to Thessaloniki to give a talk on rebranding Greece. And I said that rebranding Greeks, uh, Greece is about rebranding Greeks. Right? But to change things, we've got to really think about how we look at things. And, and I actually I gave the example of Apple, which was bankrupt in 1997, I remind you. Completely bankrupt. The company was about to close when Steve Jobs went back. It's the most valuable company in the history of companies today, which is quite remarkable. It was bankrupt. And I said, you know, Greece should be the apple of the Mediterranean. I mean, we're bankrupt, but why not become apple? Why not? And a journalist, Nick Malkutsis, picked it up and he said it's a crazy idea. In fact, it's an idea that is just about crazy enough to succeed. And I just want to stay there for a second. 
just about crazy enough to succeed. Okay? Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels. Now, this over here is what that commercial says. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They are not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. That's Greeks. That's exactly who we are. We're the crazy ones. We're the troublemakers. We're the round pegs in the square holes. It's exactly who we are. But we need to change things. We need to push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Think different. I want to talk today about the human side of innovation. Because innovation is not about technology. It's about people. And I want to talk about that. Steve Jobs always used to speak about computers being bicycles for your mind. Right? This, in fact, was what the original Macintosh was all about. The windows, the mouse. And for me, the most, the product, the Apple product that really captured that is this product here. The iPod. That's a bicycle. Do you remember what the old MP3 players used to look like, those who are old enough to remember? They were like big hi-fi sets shrunk down. There's the Rio player that had 65 buttons on the front. You couldn't even see them. And your fingers were way too big to push them. All that Jobs did was he put a wheel there. That's a bicycle. The other one is like a stupid piece of machinery. This revolutionized the world. We all carry the whole world's music in our pocket today, on our phones. The Rio player didn't do that. But the technology inside the Rio player allowed Jobs to create a human machine. And that's a big, big, big difference. The human side of innovation, I've put it against that slide because one of the most amazing things about Greece is this deep, deep, deep sense of humanness. And I want to talk a bit about that. Goethe said it, of all people, the Greeks have dreamt the dream of life best. I can see smiling faces when you look at that little varka. I know. It's the reason why I'm here. I love it. It seems that there are simple pleasures in life that only the Greeks truly understand. In today's noisy world, this may be the greatest gift the Greeks have to give. The love of life in its simplest form. Bicycles. Those chairs are like bicycles. Greeks bequeathed to us one of the most beautiful words in our language, the word enthusiasm. From the entheos, the in-God inside us. And that's the seat of much of Greek craziness and Greek genius, is the entheos. Paul F. Morphidis, cocoa mat, mattresses made out of seaweed, which are sold as the most expensive mattresses in New York today. Okay? Only a Greek like Paul F. Morphidis would serve creamy yogurt and honey in his Soho store. And if you want to try out a mattress, you're welcome to stay overnight in the private bedroom downstairs. No questions asked, by the way. <laughs> Best of all, when you buy a mattress, it's delivered to you by bike. Greeks are crazy, and we love it. This is who we are. This is who we are. And when I gave a speech, that 2011 speech, I said, you know, we need to park Zorba for a while. I've changed my mind completely. We are Zorba, and we must be Zorba. But we're looking for the, the other horse to Zorba. It's not just about dancing, but it is about humanity. The world saw Greek humanity recently. Wow. That's who we are. That word philoxenia, that word philotimo, unbelievable. We know it. 
Those words don't even exist in other languages. We'll never be good Germans, but we must become exceptional Greeks. And I get the feeling that we're trying very often to become good Germans. Forget about it. Who wants to be a German anyway? My apologies to any Germans in the room. I didn't mean that. I was just joking, okay? Can't you take a joke? And then I, I gave this, this, this interview. I said, Greece should be the California of Europe. And I really do believe that. This should be the startup capital of the world. It's got everything going for it. I love that song. Whenever I'm walking like in Europe, in a cold city, I find myself singing and smiling. <laughs> and I feel very good when I do that. Okay, let's talk a bit about mobile. Um, I was reading some statistics, and it's really quite scary. There are more mobile phones on this planet than there are toothbrushes. And there are more people with access to mobile telephony than people who've got access to toilets. It's, it's really quite amazing. It's really quite amazing. So, you know, that's where the world is going with mobile. Mobile really has connected this planet to a remarkable degree. New York Times says mobile media is the most powerful media ever invented. And I think they're totally, totally right. Totally, totally right. This is some data. This dates back to 2015. And it, it's from the Bank of America. And it talks about trends in consumer mobility. And it talks a lot about mobile. And look at these statistics down here. Millennials 18 to 24, right? What are the things you can't do without on a daily basis? Number one, mobile phone. Number two, toothbrush. Number three, deodorant. You get it? Smelly, connected people is where we're going. <laughs> Internet, laptop, car, social networks, TV, and coffee comes in at, at 48%. I mean, you know, I actually left home without my mobile today. I panicked. I panicked. And I pushed this thing on my iWatch to ping your thing. And it said I was connected, but the iWatch just hadn't kept pace of it. And I started looking all over the cab for my phone, which wasn't there. Look at what's, what, what this is creating. I mean, this market for apps is just so huge. I was astounded at these numbers. There are one and a half million apps available on the Apple App Store. And the Apple App Store, from what I understand, has got 37% market share. That's quite remarkable. That's a whole industry. It's huge. It's huge. Cumulative downloads from July 2008 to June 2015. A hundred billion downloads. That's on the Apple Store alone. Okay? That's only on the Apple Store. That's 13 apps for every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's huge. It's a whole huge economy out there. And look how it's growing exponentially. So, let's look at the killer apps of 2015, quickly. These are them, right? These are the top 10 free apps. A lot of these have got in-app in, in purchase, but these are free apps. They've obviously got ge revenue-generating models behind them, but uh, these are the top 10. And I want to focus on one of them, which is this, Snapchat. How do you guys use Snapchat? Every day! Every day! All day! Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. The question is, no when do idea. I not use Snapchat? Yeah. It's breakfast, <laughs> it's lunch. Yeah. Every couple of years, a new platform shows up and is quickly declared the future of social media. Let me explain. First, there was Friendster. Then, MySpace showed up, got rid of Friendster. Facebook came along and took out MySpace. Then Instagram showed up, but was bought off by Facebook for a billion dollars. And now there's Snapchat. Facebook tried to buy Snapchat for a reported three billion dollars, but Snapchat refused. 
How big does this pile have to be? Now, there's a new gangster in town. Say my name. Snapchat? <laughs> You're goddamn right. Two hundred million networked daily users. Until recently, zero revenue. So Mark Zuckerberg sends him a message and says, come to Menlo Park and let's get to know each other. And this young kid who's still living with his parents at home sends a message back saying, I'm happy to meet you if you come to me in L.A. And he turns down an offer of three billion. Causey says, short-term gain isn't very interesting. A couple of weeks later, months later, he raises 580 million. And that gives him an evaluation of 16 billion dollars. He still lives with his parents. <laughs> I work for a super, one of my clients is a super yacht, a luxury super yacht manufacturer. We profile certain individuals in order to, to, these are very expensive yachts, in order to profile them and design yachts around their profile. He's one of our profiles. Young kids living with their parents who might be interested in buying 200 million euro super yachts. It's pretty cool. <laughs> He's got the X factor. He's got the X factor. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the rules that I think you need to follow to get the X Factor. Because you've either got or you don't have it, right? And, and we've all watched this, this show called The X Factor. I mean, some of these people are great singers, but they just don't have it. It's not about, it's not about the technology. It's not about, the, it's not about what they do. It's, it's other stuff. And we'll talk about the other stuff, because the other stuff is really important. So, rules for the crazy ones, because you're all crazy. And if you don't realize it, you are, really. So rules for the crazy ones. Rule number one, every business that has ever existed started as a startup. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Coca-Cola started in a pharmacy in Atlanta. Just like Apivita started in a pharmacy in Pangrati. Psychico. Neopsychico. Sinaya Sofia Vipla. Arifmo? Leapport. Coca Cola. Google. Google didn't exist in 1997. Didn't exist. There was a silly thing called Yahoo. Anybody remember it? <laughs> Nike. This guy, he called it the waffle racer. You know why? The waffle racer because he made the first shoes in his wife's waffle machine in her kitchen. <laughs> and she nearly divorced him. Crazy ones. Apple. That's the very first computer. Beautiful design. Huh? Solid food. Eh? Solid food. Ah. And of course Starbucks. 23,000 coffee shops around the world with the name Starbucks on them. Okay? 23,000. Can you imagine how crazy this guy must have been back in 1991 to even think about that? He's got it. 23,000 coffee shops and the coffee sucks. <laughs> you know why? He's not selling coffee. We'll talk about that in a while. Think big. Think big. There's huge value in thinking big. There's something called a big hairy, audacious goal. Something that scares the shit out of you. That's how you got to think. Think big. I remember my dad saying to me when I was like 16, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a big deal on Madison Avenue. He laughed at me. When I got there, he stopped laughing. <laughs> BHAG, you got to have a BHAG. Big, hairy, audacious goal. You've got to have it, and I'll tell you why. And here I'm quoting from this book. It's a great book, by the way. The power of the BHAG 
is that it gets you out of thinking too small. A great BHAG changes the time frame and simultaneously creates a sense of urgency. That is a real paradox. So on the one hand, you're not going to get a BHAG done in three years. You're not going to get it done in five years. A really good BHAG probably has a minimum length of about a decade. And may take longer than that. Two decades, three decades. So time frames extend to where you're no longer managing for the quarter, but for the quarter century. On the other hand, because it's so big and so audacious and so hairy, it increases the sense of urgency. Because the only way you can achieve something big is an absolutely obsessed, monomaniacal, overwhelming intensity and focus that starts today and goes tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. For 365 days and then for 3,650 days, that's how you do it. So what the BHAG does is it makes you patient but impatient. You need that. By the way, that book was written before we had companies like Google becoming giants in the space of five years or Facebook. That's why it talks about that long, long time frame. The time frame is obviously shorter today. But it still creates a sense of patience and impatience. You need it together. This guy, a very unpopular guy at Harvard University, in 2004, he launches something called Facebook, and I'm sure he was thinking about something like that. I'm sure he was. And that's what happened. Very few years later, six years later, he's the person of the year on Time Magazine's cover. He was a kid at Harvard. He was a kid at Harvard. And I bet you that at the time that he was thinking about Facebook, there were another 200,000 kids thinking the same thing. One guy did it. I can bet my bottom dollar or my bottom euro or my drachma one of these days maybe that the idea that you might have in your head there are another 200, 300,000 people thinking exactly the same thing. So who's going to make it? That's hard reality. You want the X factor if you're going to make it. Find a solution to a problem no one knew they had. These are the best startups. Find a solution to a problem no one knew they had. The perfect search engine understands exactly what you mean and gives you back exactly what you want. I didn't know I had that issue. They told me about it. And you know something? I had that issue. They had the insight to understand me as a human being and then make technology work to solve it. Not the other way around. Technology is beautiful when it works for people. Technology that just works for technology is very impressive, but we don't necessarily buy it. Henry Ford, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. True. Steve Jobs. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. The iPod, ridiculous idea, because we used to walk around with little portable CD players with maybe five CDs in our car, and we thought, gee, that's a lot of music. And all of a sudden, this thing comes along with a thousand songs in your pocket. Do you need that? No, I don't need that. Here, you can have it. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Find solutions to problems people never knew they had. It's not about the shoes, stupid. It's not about the shoes. That's a Nike ad. They don't tell me how good their shoes are. They tell me to go and find my greatness. And they connect with me with imagery that I understand as a human being. Because I've also been a kid. I've also been scared. And they show me superstars scoring goals. They say, just do it. It's not about the shoes. It's not about the shoes. And by the way, this piece of copy is the best piece of copy that I've ever read. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is only for the chosen few. 
for the superstars. The truth is, greatness is for us all. This is not about lowering expectations. It's about raising them for every last one of us. Greatness is not in one special place, and it's not in one special person. Greatness is wherever somebody is trying to find it. Find your greatness. That's why Nike is the world's leading sports shoe brand. It's not because they make the best shoes in the world. Nobody really cares about that. Their shoes are okay. Starbucks, their coffee is not okay, but this is the biggest coffee shop in the world. 23,000 coffee shops. And inside the Pordia, which all the baristas wear, this is what's written. We create inspired moments in each customer's day. Anticipate, connect, personalize, own. Oh, by the way, I didn't show you my new airs. <laughs> this is the new Tsaruhi air. <laughs> and it's done by a friend of mine, Caroline Rovithi. It's amazing. She does amazing stuff. I'm going to take this off, actually. I like this T-shirt. Costa, I promise you I'll get you one, okay? What size are you? Build your brand. Build your brand. Let me show you why. <laughs>
you have to create a movement around an idea that solves a problem that people didn't know they had. That, at the end of the day, is what you've got to do. That's what you have to do if you want to be a killer rap. And this is how you do it. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. It's an amazing little video. I mean, that's three minutes, right? That is the most important curve in marketing. This is everything. This is the normal distribution curve, okay? These are the categories. This is where the money is. This is where killer apps become killer apps, but this is where they start, okay? Don't ever, ever forget this. This is the most important curve in marketing. You've got to find these people over here, the crazy ones that you saw in that video. These are the ones that get everybody else to dance. Without them, they don't dance. Okay? And then you, you ride that curve. Here's the tipping point. It's right here. This is where things start to happen. Sell to the multipliers and let the multipliers sell to the world. Sell to the multipliers. Let the multipliers sell to the world. This guy over here has just given 500 pounds, euros, dollars, whatever it is to Apple. He doesn't even know what's in that box. He's going to go home and make an unboxing video and put it on YouTube. He's going to get like a million views. He works for Apple. He doesn't know it. We follow those who lead, and I'm going to close with this, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. It's a human thing. It's not about great technology, it's about humans. And great technology serving humans. 
My final little lesson is play jazz. Play jazz. When I studied at university, I, I thought that I was learning how to conduct orchestras. I wasn't. You know, the marketing plan and, you know, brief the ad agency and then do this and do that. It's not like that. It's jazz. It's jazz. You've got to forget everything you've ever learned and understand that you're playing jazz. And jazz means you improvise. Jazz means you listen to the audience. Jazz means that you change direction. Jazz means that you be like Miles. It's Miles Davis, by the way. So, quickly to summarize, every business start as a startup. Number one rule. Number two, think big. Get a BHAG. Number three, find a solution to a problem no one knew they had. Number four, it's not about the shoes, stupid. Number five, build your brand. Number six, start with why. Number seven, the shirtless man. And my final one is play jazz. Forget everything you've ever learned. Closing here, I've heard there's going to be a recession. I've decided not to participate. <laughs> Walt Disney. Walt Disney. But don't forget this. We must free ourselves of the hope that the sea will ever rest. We must learn to sail in high winds. Aristotle or Nassus. Thank you.